previously on the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. The prosecution is ready, my lord. And so is my little Maya friend. Yeah. <laughs> hey, look. Look at the little Nipponese friend. I've got my own Suzuto. Jealous. No, I've got the original Suzuto. Shut up. My Suzuto's better. And now back to legging it, people. Hello. Sneak up B. Back with some more of the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. When we last left off, things started to get a little freaking nutty as I tried to piece together what the crap has gone on in this crazy case. <laughs> Which I did see you guys mention that a lot of people apparently struggle with this case. And so I, I saw some of you even say that it might be the toughest case in the entire Ace Attorney series altogether. Which makes me feel at least a little bit better, though I still think the, the some of the stuff that I was like, the mistakes I was making were still like, it seemed like more like a me problem. Like, like finding the deduction between uh, that woman uh, and what the other guy was saying, because I was, I don't know, I was getting my words mixed up and shit. It's like, no, he's, not, he's talking about this, the waxer figure, not the fucking, or, or the, I don't even remember, I don't even remember anymore. So many things happening. There's a lot of moving parts in this one. I feel like it, it is pretty easy to uh, lose track of exactly who is who, because that, this is what I'm like running into. So we got, we got the professor, we've got the waxwork model, we've got uh, Enoch Drebber himself, the defendant, which I guess is Hairbrain, and now seemingly Courtney Scythe is a part of this, seems to be an accomplice in everything. And we still have yet to piece together exactly how this illusion was done, right? It seemingly that Scythe came in and switched out the the bodies or the cages or something. There's still a seemingly a cage that is not here, right? That is that should be here, but it's not. We found the cage that fell down the the trap door, but where did the other one go? Did they just I mean that seems like a kind of a hard thing to have like gotten rid of. Unless, well, I guess did that get taken back to like the forensic lab or something? And who got the one that was in the hole then? Because I remember the, the one in the hole was like, we just kind of looked down and like that cage was not here before, right? Like who got that? Who brought it up and like set it over to the side? Were they getting ready to move it and take it somewhere? I don't know, man. Like the, the order of events in this case is like, I just, it's a lot of shit is happening. At what point did the forensic investigation team come in and potentially mess with stuff? What was her motive for doing so? Um, I, I still think it's going to tie in right that, uh, for whatever reason, she let this professor guy live. I, that's what I think this is coming to, uh, probably due to some personal relationship to this person. I don't know. She's just, she's crazy though. <laughs> so I, I guess I, I should be at least grateful that it's not just me, but, but I still feel like, come on, Nico, come on, get your head out of your ass. You're better than this. All right. You've gone through like a hundred of these games now. You should know this shit by this point. Come on. But anyway, uh, last episode, uh, Draco Vax said, uh, TGAA in a nutshell. First investigation. Okay, let's go find some evidence that he didn't kill the mailman. Second investigation. Let's go find where the butler hit the nuclear launch codes. <laughs> yes, a va very large escalation in stakes. Although I will say I am happy that seemingly almost every investigation here has had this uh, connection to a greater stake. Even like the cases with McGundle, uh, Giselle Brett, clearly. No, even, I think even the the case with Shamspear and Saseki still tied into this uh, case of uh, uh, this guy having this evidence that I think does relate to the larger case. So it's like every case in some little tiny fashion, I think is related to the bigger picture here. And I fucking love that, dude. I love that. I love having everything be tied to a greater narrative, you know, even if it's relatively minute, because then it makes it feel like you're working towards something, right? I don't know. So it's just after a while, like it can be kind of annoying to when you get these cases that like are so self-contained that they just don't affect anything. And not to say you can't get good cases that way, but it just, I don't know, man. I, I like feeling like there is like a greater purpose to it all. But anyway, uh, I'm getting off topic. Draco, thank you so much for your, your truly accurate comment. And as for that reason, you are comment of the day. By the way, I did see some of you guys argue that the reason why they couldn't have said, oh, well, uh, the bomb didn't necessarily come from Enoch Drebber, the second bomb, um, because he was kind of, he wasn't exactly admitting that he did it. He just said, oh, you have disarmed that bomb. I mean, I, and I guess so, I guess. I just wasn't so much that, oh, I was expecting them to literally be like, arrest him and like, they've got all the evidence they need. It was more that I was surprised that they weren't saying anything about it, <laughs> that they weren't like, oh yeah, I think it was pretty obvious that it was him, but we're not gonna be able to prove that in court. You're right, we're gonna have to go about it another way. Like, I just expected somebody to say something, that's, that's it. And I just thought it was weird that 
Naruto and them were just like, oh, I don't know where that bomb could have come from. I don't know. They they just seemed, didn't seem really like they were entirely confident about it. Though, that said, uh, seeing as Courtney Scythe is likely an accomplice here, right? It's actually much more likely that she was the one that set up the bomb to blow it up, right? That when she went to go investigate with her team, she set the bomb, uh, they left, and I guess they kept some police guys there, uh, and then blew it up that way. That's what I'm thinking, at least. Because what, what opportunity would Enoch Drebber had to actually put that in there? And, unless he did it when he constructed it initially. But I mean, imagine they would still have to have like a, like he'd probably have to be close enough to be able to like turn on the, the time bomb or, or whatever. And I don't know, man. I mean, this is like, what, the early 1900s? I, I think it might be a little early for shit like that. I think it's more like put a clock down with a bomb and let it rock. But all right, I don't know if this is actually the final part of the trial or not. We're bringing in Madame Two Spells to talk about the waxwork thing, but it's not necessarily Courtney's side. So I don't know if like, we're gonna bring her in and do our little interrogation thing and then to be continued, then Courtney side or, or what? But uh, all right, here we go. How much crazier is this shit gonna get? Um, October 24th. 11.53 a.m., the old Bailey defendant in Sandy Chamber. Ah, oh, the knight errant himself. Oh, have you been watching from the gallery, Mr. Holmes? I've been on the edge of my seat the entire time. I'm like, God damn it, you're gonna fuck this up, aren't you, Naruto? No, you should have pressed there. No, you need to present evidence there. God, do I have to go down there and do it all myself? Courtroom trials are fascinating affairs, as suspected at least. I'm glad you've been enjoying yourself. I'm not enjoying myself! I have to ask. What on earth is going on? It makes no sense! What's this professor business all about? He doesn't look like any professor I've met before. Who even is he? Uh, of course. Yeah, I don't I don't know how it's connected either yet. You were in Germany already ten years ago. Yes, the professor. When I discovered he was the one who had been abducted, a sense of foreboding stirred within me. But who knew the monster would come knocking at your door? My heart feels sympathies. <laughs> oh. As it turns out, Lord Fancy is even more intimately tied to this case than any of us realize, isn't he? Yes, how true. His great friend from university in the dock. And now, a waxwork of the killer who took his esteemed brother's life makes an appearance too. I imagine even the shrewd Mr. Reaper failed to foresee that kick in the teeth. An extraordinary move on your part, my dear fellow, to throw that in front of the man. I do wonder, like, so if this professor ends up being alive, I feel like it's probably just going to be just some dude, right, that we don't know. I do wonder, like, who? I'm trying to think who could it possibly be. My guess, just based literally on plot and no fucking details, uh, what if it's fucking Lord Strongheart himself? What if he's the killer? And I... I that doesn't make any sense to me because he seemingly is is so far, right? He's seemingly a guy that is willing to go to any ends to achieve his justice, right? But he is trying to achieve justice with this forensic team and everything. Unless it's like a front to set up stuff, like maybe Courtney Scythe is like an underling to him and he's using her to to hide the evidence of any like British interference and shit. Maybe so maybe that's like the problem. Like there, like there is some good in there, but it's also mixed in with some bad because they're trying to cover up British dark's dirty secrets. And that doesn't really make sense to me because I don't think if that were truly the case, it's kind of hard to believe that even if the identity wasn't known, it's hard to imagine that a serial killer would have grown to fucking power. And I, hell, he might've already been in power uh, 10 years ago when this shit was happening. I, I don't know. That's the only thing I could really, the only character I could really think of off the top that we know that I was like, oh, he could be the bad guy, you know? But I think it's also just me predicting that at some point, Strongheart's going to be an antagonist. I do hope that if that is the case, I hope that it's a bit more nuanced than what some other antagonists we've had in the series are. I think uh, Damon Gant was okay. I think they did an all right job with him. Though he was still ended up being, I think, pretty evil, if I remember correctly. I don't know. That's just my thought. You make it sound deliberate. I can't help feeling. This professor case is really very puzzling. No shit. Oh yes, in what particular matter? Well, there's Mr. Drebber, Dr. Scythe, and Lord Van Zeeks. And then there's a waxwork figure, and then there's fucking hairbrain, and then there's some other guys. I'm getting confused, there's so many things happening. Seems that everybody in the trial is linked to the case somehow. Somehow. Yes, 
In fact, I alone am not a member of the set. Well, that leaves me as an empty set. All alone with no intersection to any other. Uh, excuse me? Oh, God! Uh-oh. Oh, she's gonna be mega angry at me. <laughs> Dr. Scythe! Oh, oh, God. Ah, uh, Dr. Courtney Scythe. Me, Stevens. Good day to you. Hello, Holmes. That was very shrewd of you. What in particular, pray? You requested that 10-year-old autopsy report from Gregson, didn't you? Why would you assume such a thing? Because Gregson told me. <laughs> oh, well, in that case. To think it's been 10 years. 10 years in the laboratory wielding my scalpel. I smell of nothing but corpses and disinfectant. The policeman on the jury had a lot to say about you as it happens, Dr. Scythe. And I've accused you of being complicit in what happened. I'm hoping that you'll take the stand and tell the truth about what really happened. That certainly won't be possible. Lord Van Seeks won't be summoning me as a witness. Lord Strongheart has forbidden it. Lord Strongheart? The Pandora's box you were warned about is the Professor case. But please don't make the mistake of thinking you'll get any information about it out of me. Huh. But attempting to hide from the truth, that's cowardice. Damn, she's dope. I've always fought crime in the way that I see fit. I've no regrets, none at all. And that's all I came here to say. So, good day to you. Hmm. I see. Yeah. So, clearly the evidence that we came across before, the, the, the dog collar or whatever collar it was that had blood on it, that Holmes didn't want us to write about or talk about, you know, that is going to be absolutely related to the professor case, probably his dog and the identity of the professor. And that's like the shit that we're not supposed to talk about because it's probably going to unearth some dank British secrets, right? But we're getting there. We're starting to it's starting to tie into shit. We're starting to see the the bigger picture, at least in some some outline, which is cool. She mentioned it too. This Pandora's box. Whatever does it all mean? There's really no cause for concern. I show you. When the trial resumes, the meaning will become all too apparent, whether you'd like it to or not. Huh? Now then, I believe it's almost time. So we're not actually going to get her up there? I wonder if we're going to be able to even uncover everything in this trial then. I must make my way back to the public gallery. The edge of my seat awaits. I think maybe you're enjoying yourself a little too much. Ah, yes. One word of warning before I go. If in the course of the trial this afternoon you perceive even a shadow of doubt about the truth, don't let it out of your sight. Pursue it like a dog with a bone. Or a dog at the fucking jugular of another person. Oh, I see what I did there. Yes, I, I saw your dark joke. Now get out of here. To the bitter end, you understand. Do not falter whatever may come to pass. All right. I understand. Thank you. Good. I shall make myself scarce then. I purchased a bar of caramel earlier, so I shall be gnawing on that as you gnaw away at the truth. Holmes Caramel? What? You have your own brand of caramel? That's gonna play into something, right? There's no way they just make a graphic for that. I wouldn't think so, unless they sell it. Capcom sells it. What did that warning for Mr. Holmes really mean, I wonder? Especially the bit about whatever may come to pass. Oh boy, this shit's about to get crazy. It's time for the final chapter then. Oh, I guess this is it. I'm determined to find the truth, no matter what. Huh. It's ending with Mountain 2 spells coming up here? October 24th, 12.40 p.m. The Old Bailey Court Room. Rubble, 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 rubble. Oh, yeah, fucking waxwork figure. In the name of the Majesty the Queen, I hereby reconvene the proceedings of this court. Counsels for the defense and prosecution, are you ready to enable to continue? <laughs> I like how uh, fucking, uh... 
The Sogi assistant there hasn't said shit since this thing started. He's all he's done is literally cut the cork off a bottle and hand him a scroll. Great job. You're a fucking great assistant. You're nowhere near as exciting as Susato. Get your shit together, man. I don't care if you're all mysterious and mute. That's no fun at all. We're supposed to bounce off each other with funny banter. Might as well be all by myself up here again. The prosecution is ready, my lord. Yes, my lord. The defense is also ready. As the court's aware, the case under our scrutiny began with a damaging incident at the Great Exhibition. Yet we now find ourselves embroiled in the details of a convicted felon who was sent to the gallows a decade ago. This trial has certainly defied all expectation. As seems to be the fate of all trials in which this Nipponese is involved, my lord. It's almost like it's all tied together some greater plot. What the hell is this, a video game? So then, let us begin our exploration of the defense's assertion that the waxwork was cardinally involved in this matter. Lord Van Zeeks. My lord. Are we still awaiting the arrival of Madame Two Spells? Not at all. She's in the antechamber as we speak and ready to be summoned. And get your sexy ass in here. Very well, bring in the witness. At once, my lord. Bailiff. Oh, good, I'm here too. Show Madame Two Spells to the stand. Okay, you sexy thing. Things are about to become a lot more intense. Oh, wow, I don't see myself from this angle usually. If Drepper is responsible, as I'm sure he is, it means he must have had an accomplice in Dr. Scythe. And what connects the pair of them is the waxwork. Yes, the model of the professor. That's the key to the link between these otherwise unrelated individuals. It's a tenuous link, admittedly, but at present, it's all we have to go on. <laughs> wow. Oh, she's working on a home sculpture. Wow. Look at her go. Damn. It's just uh, going to casually do that the entire trial. Oh, God. Here we go. Another gimmicky fucking witness. Great. Can't wait to deal with you. Uh, state your name and occupation for the court, please. My name is Madame Mesmeralda Two Spells, and I am a waxwork artisan. And the proprietors of the Madame Two Spells Museum of Waxwork. You have to pardon me for working as I testify. My new exhibit must open very soon. <laughs> oh, for God's sakes. Ah, oh, so he finally gets a statue, does he? Now there are two of them in the world. God help us. Oh my, what expression is she carving into that face? Oh Lord. A number of days ago, a particular wax or model was stolen from your museum. Can you confirm this? Oui, that is true. At first, we believed they had been kidnapped. A waxwork model? Kidnapped? My word! Yes, my lord. There was a demand for ransom money left behind by the culprit. However, according to what I have just been told outside the courtroom, that was not the true reason. I understand it was utilized as a substitute for the body of a murder victim. At present, that is no more than conjecture proposed by the defense. This is the victim of the, ca the case in question, Mr. Odie Asmin. But of course, I know him well. He's a part of my odious per per personages exhibit. I detest to say what is evident, but Mr. Asmin does not resemble the professor at all. Yes, but perhaps, perhaps their faces are very similar. Are you suggesting that we should see now the Dumas vis visage of the professor? Oh. I have here the key, but it is strictly forbidden to open the lock. This is absurd. Pardon? I don't know what face you've carved into your fancy figure beneath that mask. But clearly, it won't be that of the actual killer. Indeed. The man's identity was never made public after all. Yeah. The trial took place in a closed court. The proceedings were strictly confidential. The condemned man was summarily executed. His identity remains a closely guarded national secret. There is no possible way that a repository of tawdry exhibits could get his hands on that information. Quell de more. It would seem you are unaware of the two spells principles. What principles? The family two spells has always prided itself on sculpting its models a la perfection. Every detail, including the visage, is fashioned with complete fidelity. Et voila, our principles. There's a well-known legend about the Two Spells waxwork, waxworks from the time of the French Revolution. A member of the Two Spells family is said to have made a waxwork of the queen who was executed. 
Oui, that is true. It was a century ago now. I believe the queen's face was carved in the minutes following her death, actually at the guillotine site. You are correct. The model is on display still today in the House of Horrors. We two spells still stop at nothing to obtain a faithful replica of our subjects. Ah, dear me. A somewhat disturbing tenacity of purpose. It is the only way to obtain a truly lifelike representation of the subject. And it has been my family's secret for generations. D do you mean to say that beneath that mask? Oui, the true visage of the killer is there. This is ludicrous. It's out of the question. The professor spread terror throughout Great Britain. As a result, the Madame Tussauds special exhibit remains extremely popular, even today. The killer, emerging from his own grave. It is a sight to behold. You should come. Ooh, interesting. That's what I was thinking. I was like, there's no way this, this like, that's really going to be his face under there. But, ooh, mmm. Does Van Zeeks know already? Like, he seems super fucking pissed about this shit, though. I mean, granted, it's, it is very closely tied to him, so it makes sense why he'd be, like, on edge and upset. But, I don't know. His reaction is interesting. I think, madam, it would be beneficial to hear your formal testimony on this matter. You explain every detail of this macabre model, and your personal involvement is, is creation. With pleasure. The Professor Waxwork. The special exhibit in the House of Horrors is based on a rumor that shocked society in London. An impression of the visage was taken directly from the corpse, in accordance with Two Spells' family principles. I enlisted the aid of the grave digger and created a mold for the head in the cemetery just before the in in interment. I hid myself until he gave me a signal. I was there for a very long time that night. As dawn approached, I was very worried that I could be discovered. Ugh. The grave digger? The man sanctioned this? Oui. I will do all that is necessary to achieve the true resemblance my family is celebrated for. Nobody else knew. Only the grave digger. What harm did it do? Uh huh? So you truly saw it? The face of that monster! Naturally. I was aware at the time that his identity was a secret. But two spells would not be two spells if we did not insist on absolute fidelity to our sculptures. I don't believe this. I myself have seen the special exhibit at your museum, madam. A truly blood-curdling scene in which the murderer is emerging from his own grave. The scene it depicts was the subject of many rumors in London ten years ago. I have here a newspaper from the time. And there's uh, Enoch Drebber. The special exhibit was based upon the picture in this article. What? What the fuck? Why is there a signature of Odie Asman in the corner? Mr. Drebber's dreadful encounter. Was he the one that took the picture? Or something? It was the most detailed account of what happened, as reported by the eyewitnesses. The eyewitness who saw it. A newspaper article recounting the tale of an eyewitness to the alleged resurrection of the professor from his grave on the night of his execution. What? Uh, hold on, hold on. What the fuck is this doing here? Uh, and we have it, right? Yeah, it's the same signature. Uh, what the hell? I don't understand. Why? Why? I'm guessing it means that this is his, he was the one that took the picture, I, I would think. Though the, the camera, though, this is him, right? This is uh, Enoch Drebber. Are we suggesting that they are the same person? What? Or something? Wait. Are we? That would seem a little ridiculous because these two guys do not look that similar. Yeah, they really don't look that similar. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. But then that that would actually explain then, right? Why? Well, well would it? Would it though? Like, oh, this would mean he could get all the money or whatever. But that would that still says that if that this would then not uphold the condition if both if only both parties are alive, right? That still means that technically in their eyes he's dead. Doesn't, I don't know, man. Ah, fuck it, I don't know. I'm getting ahead of myself. Just keep going. Man rises from the grave. It's too absurd for words. The public enjoy absurdity, monsieur. That is why I have reproduced the scene as carefully as possible in my museum. And it's a waxwork from that exhibit that was stolen some days before the incident of the Great Exhibition, wasn't it? That is correct. 
the professor you see before you here? Mm, most puzzling. Calls over the defense. Proceed with the pro cross examination. This waxwork links to Reverend to Dr. Scythe, and there has to be some reason for that, which hasn't yet come to light. But I'll find it. I'll get to the bottom of real what really happened. I'll prove that Dr. Scythe and Drebber were in on this crime together. Oh God, okay. Damn, you, you're kind of a you're kind of a creepy lady yourself too. You're like fucking. I'm gonna dig up this dead Lazarus body and make him perfect, right? The perfect face, the perfect figure. The Professor Waxwork. All right, uh, I'm gonna just go with this. I enlisted the aid of the Grave Digger and created a mold for the head in the cemetery for the inter interment. Hold it! Surely that's illegal, isn't it? It would seem the proprietors of this repository of novelties was blinded by the monetary greed. It had nothing to do with money. The part, the man is part of London's criminal history. That's why I had to sculpt him to record this history. It is the raison d'etre of the Duspels Museum. But if the man was convicted in a closed court and sent for the immediate execution, then surely nobody but the members of the judiciary present know the killer's true identity. I assure you, behind that mask is hidden the true face of the professor. Do you realize what you're saying? The professor's identity is a national secret! I understand. And now that the truth about the special exhibit has been revealed, it must perhaps close. Of course it will. As will your entire museum if you don't tread very carefully, madam. That could be another interesting chapter in the history of my family, I think, don't you? Oh man, he's this is Vezik is he's getting livid, dude. So ten years ago, on the night of the professor's execution, you took a wax impression of his face from the corpse. We oui, exact him all. Uh, okay, didn't really. Get, I thought I would elaborate the, on the grave digger. Uh, I hit myself until he gave me a signal. I was there for a very long night. Hold it! You were there longer than you expected to be. I had some difficulties in capturing the subject's form correctly. As I removed the mask, the mouth of the cadaver fell open, and I had some problems with the chin. Ugh. Dare I ask? The man had been dead for a short while already, you see. His muscles were relaxing, and consequently, his chin would not align itself correctly. Oh dear, what a horrible thought. Under normal circumstances, I would have an assistant with me. <laughs> a Suzuto, if you will! However, that night, I was alone, and as a consequence, I missed my preferred window of time. What do you mean? When I took the impression of the visage of a cadaver, I always wait until three hours after death. Why three hours? Is that amount of time significant? It's uh, rigor mortis. It's because of rigor mortis. Yep. Uh, uh, Riggly mortis? A uh, wriggly diggly doodly? I got a handy bandy bookie! It's the name given to a phenomenon that occurs in the recently deceased bodies. As a rule, three hours post death, the muscles in the body begin to stiffen. By approximately 10 hours post death, the body is completely rigid and inflexible. And then from that point on, the muscles slowly start to revert to their relaxed state. The effect is often used to estimate the time of death when a body is discovered. Well, that was an education, if sli a slightly scary one. As the Mademoiselle says, Rick Mortis commences three hours after death, and it starts on the jaw. I see. So that's why you wait. Before that time, the mouth falls open, and it is very difficult to do my work. Ugh. It's getting hard for me to do my work with all this talk of corpses. Hmm. Wonder about that information in the court. It's just her from Mam Two Spells. Significant. Um, the information about rigor mortis that you just shared with us. Would you mind including it in your formal testimony? I believe it could be significant, you see. Of course. I do not mind at all. I can't help feeling that after this latest topic, the atmosphere in the courtroom has become extremely... grave. Wah, wah. It's no time for jokes, Miss Suzuto. You stop with your silly billiness. <laughs> and then Van Six looks over to us and says, See, this is what you should be doing. Funny little weird, terrible puns like that girl over there. Why can't you do things like that? Stands there perfectly silent. You're the worst. Worst assistant ever. Should never have hired you. I should have hired that little pink bobble-haired girl. But I had the chance. 
She was at least funny and bubbly. You're nothing of the sort. You sicken me. Madam, kindly made your testimonies discussed. Buncha. Okay. It took me a very long time because it was before the onset of rigor mortis. Uh, I don't, I don't really see anything here that I, off the bat. It took me a long time, so we're trying to say that it didn't take you a long time. I don't see anything in the paper here that indicates like a, a time. Actually, maybe I should read this thing to the side here. Man rides from the grave. Executed criminal returns in the dead of night at local cemetery. A located cemetery just behind the prison on the night of that foul demon's execution. The newly interred professor forced off his grave cover as he clawed free of the earth. The young man who witnessed this scene was on the verge of raising a shriek when in the next second, a gunshot rang out suddenly from behind. The bullet pierced the resurrected man's chest whose breath then stilled once more. The youth then finally raised the scream he had been holding and ran for his life. What the fuck? What? So he was shot by somebody? What the hell? We're saying two spells shot him or something? Or is this just some horse shit they threw together to make it more sound more epic? But it actually was not Enoch Drebber either. That, that I mean, granted, I mean, you can see in the picture, he doesn't actually have it. I also, I'd be wondering then who took this picture? Technically, if, if I was thinking like, well, he's the photographer, right? Well, but at the same time, he's standing there. Is this, I, I can't tell if this is actually a piece of art or it's supposed to be a photograph. I guess, oh, oh, maybe Odie Asman? That, that is in the corner there. So, I don't fucking know. Is Odie Asman shot? The, I'm so confused. <laughs> It's just fucking insane, dude. I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't see anything in here that really like indicates that she could have done it faster or something. I feel like there's some, I might be have to get more information from pressing her. So I guess we'll press this too. Hold it. Rigor Morse being the phenomenon you described, whereby the corpse becomes stiff after death. I think you said that it starts at the jaw about three hours post death. Is that right? We oui, say. Say, sir, of course, the, the exact duration depends a little on the season. I didn't realize a waxwork artist would be so well versed in the subject. No, none. That is only elementary knowledge in the field of legal medicine. Well, I had no idea about it, but maybe I won't admit to my ignorance about forensic science. Hmm. I could ask my father to give you a very simple primer if you'd like. <laughs> God dang it, stop listening to my inner thoughts that I whisper out. I think corpses should be your domain. I'm not good with them. Oh dear, I'll do my very best. Okay, that definitely did not help. Uh, as Dawn approached, I was very worried that I could be discovered. Hold it! I guess I'll press you there too. You see that Dawn was approaching? What was the time of day then, approximately? Well, I could not say, but when I left the cemetery with my utensils and wax, the morning light was becoming visible. The execution took place on the 17th of June, which had the earliest sunrise of that year. Indeed it did. First light would have been around 4.40 in the morning. That really is early. Oh, okay, 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 here we go. Right, that doesn't match up though, does it? Because he was executed, right? Hold on. Uh, Yeah, confirmed at midnight. And then she came in and Rick Morse had not kicked in yet. That means it, it would have been, if she was there around like uh, three or 440 or whatever, the rigmore should have kicked in. Yeah, that's it. I'm not exactly sure why she'd be lying about this. That really is early. The fact is I had very little time, so I finished my work in half an hour. It was necessary to complete the impression and bury the body before daybreak, of course. If somebody had discovered me there, it would have been a catastrophe, so I had to hurry. Is it me or does Mr. Holmes seem to be taking shape more quickly now too? <laughs> Mm, you certainly appear to have ex got extraordinary lengths for your work, madam. Disturbingly extraordinary lengths. Uh, I wonder if, what she said, particularly significant. Uh, yes. Man, this is the part I have to go after? Madam, those details about how long it took you to complete the sculpture in the early sunrise. Could you include them in your testimony? I believe they may be significant. Of course, if you would like me to. You're quite right, Mr. Narahoto. It is intriguing. A sunrise at four in the morning. Would be absolutely unimaginable at home, wouldn't it? That's not quite what I meant by significant. Kindly admit your formal testimony then, madam. With pleasure, my lord. Interesting. Was the other one not necessary then? I hurried to finish my work in the, ha in the half hour before sunrise. Then I left as soon as the corpse was interred. No, it, it is. I absolutely had to get this one too because 
Thing is, now I've, I've figured out that the rigor mortis is three hours after death, right? And now that I have this one, uh, and saying my work in the half hour before the sunrise, meaning she would have been there at four, rigor mortis would have kicked in. Booyah, grandma. Objection. What? Oh, God damn it. Ow! Did I present to the wrong thing? Maybe I should have done this one? Objection. There we go. I, mean, I know this is fucking right. Map to spells. I have here an autopsy report that was filed 10 years ago now. Confirms the death of the professor following his execution of the gallows. This is similar to that thing that happened before where, again, I... While I didn't specifically use information or like get something added to my my court record, right, based on something that the the uh, person on the stand said, I still managed to glean something myself that helped me to know what piece of evidence I had to present. I still think I probably had to have gotten both of those statements for uh, me to proceed here. Like I, I think if I had just had that there and presented whatever uh, the autopsy report was, I, I probably would not have worked. Actually, you know what? We can actually test that. We can actually test that. I am, I'm actually legitimately curious. So I've got that here. I have not gotten the other statement yet. Objection. Oh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Forget what I said. I guess I could have. I guess on her, the rest of her statement was enough to indicate that, I, I guess? <laughs> I'm actually a little surprised by that. But anyway, whatever. Map to spells. I have here an autopsy report that was filed 10 years ago now. It confirms the death of the professor following his execution of the gallows. I think it's more of a, this is meant to help the player though, right? Which is cool. Regardless, either way, I still think it's actually a, a good thing, you know? Like basically it does give us the information that we uh, we need to piece it together ourselves. I am a little surprised that it wasn't required, but uh, regardless, still cool. And is that a problem? I believe it is, because your testimony and a particular detail in the report completely contradict one another. Quoi? Okay, or quoi? I don't know. Are you going to explain yourself, my Nipponese friend? According to her testimony, Madame Two Spells was creating her waxwork impression just before dawn. Yeah, I guess that was enough information. I guess that was enough to just to be able to push this. And still, just before dawn was still like. That was so many hours after midnight, so yeah, yeah, that was still enough. I just it just gave you a little bit more oomph, so you could, if you hadn't figured it out, you could still piece it together. And at that time, rigor mortis had not yet set in. Am I correct so far, madam? You are, yes. As I said, the stiffening of the jaw is the first sign of rigor mortis, two to three hours after death. But the man's chin was limp, so he cannot have been dead for a long time. But on the other hand. If you look at Dr. Sai's report, it quite clearly states the following. Death by hanging confirmed at midnight, 17th June. No. Hmm. I think the indication actually is that the body in there is actually not the body of the professor that they put back in there. I think it's like a, I think it was a fake cadaver, potentially. Maybe another prisoner that was executed. If the professor indeed died at midnight that day, then by the time you were sculpting his face, rigor mortis would already have set in. We? Yes, you are right. The chin, it would have been completely stiff. In other words, this report is wrong. Objection! Objection! No coroner makes mistakes when recording the time of death. The very idea is absurd. In that case, there's only one possible conclusion. The execution didn't actually take place at the state of time. Ah, uh, impossible. Order, order, council, this is beyond folly. Not only do you indict the author of the report, Dr. Scythe, but you also implicate members of staff at Barkley Prison where the execution took place. My heck, extraordinary. Not in my day. Objection, I'm gonna say it again. My learned friend appears to have overlooked one very crucial fact. What fact? The professor died that night. Without question. He did. Of course he did. I moved the man's limp jaw with my own hands. There was no yes, the professor died that night. But what if he didn't die at the gallows? 
lived and died. Are you insane? What? What exactly are you suggesting did happen in that case? It's almost impossible to believe, but it would explain the link between Dr. Scythe, the professor, and that one other person of interest. I have evidence that will explain exactly what I'm suggesting happened that night. Oh. Council, present the evidence at once. The evidence that allegedly explains what really happened on the night of the professor's execution. Jesus. This article. Yeah. What happened that night is written very plainly in this newspaper article. Good thing I went and read that. <laughs> I was just looking at the picture and kind of glossing over it. Executed criminal returns to the dead of night at local cemetery. Oh. That's... Wow. That's very interesting. So he was not dead and he was literally buried alive he can't, actually he could did come out of the ground and then somebody shot him and that's what killed him you're suggesting it was a corpse coming back from the dead now well if this article is to be believed yes damn tabloids the professor assumed dead following his execution emerged from his grave and was killed again objection, objection. Don't be a fool! That's simply a rumor published by the gutter press! Can you be certain of that? Are you serious? The point is, as the article says, there was a witness to what happened. My word, yes indeed. Ma oui, my- God damn it. I don't know any pronunciations for- Stop saying fresh lady! My e, my e oui? <laughs> my oui, the young man is stolen to the cemetery about just that night. Objection! Yeah, I've seen a lot this episode. Of course there was a witness. The story didn't write itself, but obviously the man made it all up. And in any case, this was ten years ago now. There would surely be no hope of finding him. Well, actually, on the contrary, my lord, we all know this witness well. What? Are you suggesting, counsel, that you've identified the person in question? That you know claims to have seen these utterly incredible events that take place? Yes, my lord. In fact, you can say that he's right here before my very eyes. <laughs> my big bulgy eyes. You will substantiate your latest claim now then, counsel. Who is the alleged witness of this staggering scene from the cemetery 10 years ago? Da, 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 da. Mr. Odie Asman. I must say, I'm quite staggered by the scene I see before me now, counsel. Oh, God damn it. Okay, I guess we're not saying him yet. I, I couldn't tell if they meant... Uh, okay, they, they actually did mean you, Dr. Rubber. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I couldn't tell if they meant... The guy I was watching this happen... No, they, they, they meant the young man. I, I I initially thought you, Dr. Rubber, but then I thought about it more. I was like, wait, do they mean the guy that's seemingly, like, taking this picture or whatever? Anyway. The man in question is Mr. Enoch Drebber. Drebber. The, the previous witness... The special exhibit in the House of Horrors and Madame Tussauds Museum of Waxwork recreates that decade-old scene in great detail. The condemned criminal emerging from the grave and beside the tomb, a young man with a lantern stumbling upon the terrifying sight. And that young man is a 10-year younger Mr. Enoch Drebber with darker hair. Dude, there's gotta be fan art of this. <laughs> I swear to God. Mam Two Spells, like, design. She's so fucking adorable. There's gotta be a fuck ton of fan art of her. And if there isn't, there should be. I need it for reasons. Order, order, order. Surely not, Council. Drebber was there in Loki's Cemetery. Um, what does all this talk about, Mr. Drebber? Is the name significant? Of course, Mam Two Spells doesn't know, does she? Yes, you missed the first part of this shit. Yes, it's extremely significant, madam, to your situation as well, in fact. What situation? The theft of the Professor Waxwork from your museum some days ago was perpetrated by the very same man. No, but what's that would mean? Ma'am to spells. It would appear you know the name Enoch Drebber. We, oui, yes, I know it, but from long ago, in the past. What? Oh my. Good gracious. Oh, for God's sakes, explain yourself. Tell us everything you know. 
Yes. Yes, of course. Tell us. The story of the young man and the terrible sight he witnessed in the cemetery ten years ago was published in every single newspaper in London and throughout Great Britain. However, in all of the articles, the witness was simply described as a certain young man. No details were published about his identity. His name was never revealed. Wait, what? It says right here, university student is Mr. Enoch Drebber. That is, apart from in one newspaper. Okay, so, sorry, I had to let you finish your sentence there. The Daily Circus is the paper from which comes the article I have already shown the court. You're saying that his full name was only published, publicized in that article? Goodness me, yes, here it is. The university student who experienced the shocking event is Mr. Enoch Drebber, a disciple of science at the University of London and a resident of its student dorms. Unbelievable. When I read the article, I went to meet with the man. His discovery of the condemned criminal coming back to life in the cemetery in the dead of night would make a perfect exhibit for my house of horrors, whether it was the truth or not. Right, because she would have had to... Wait, so, okay, hold, hold on a second. So was the who is the gravekeeper then? Is that just not anybody? Does that person not matter? Is it Odie Asman? I thought, I don't know, for some reason, I thought the, the grave digger w was Enoch Drubber. But no, it's, I guess, somebody else. Yeah, he, he was the one that just happened to come across it, but he wasn't actually the grave digger, which, or the grave keeper, which I guess makes sense, according to the article as well. I see. So you went to meet Mr. Drebber in order to sculpt a waxwork of the man, did you? Exactement. He was studying science at the University of London in those days. He was just a poor student. I paid him five pounds to model for the waxwork. And since that time, it has been in my museum to recreate the scene of terror from the cemetery. Yeah, I see. Yeah, in that case, I, I thought I thought that's the person she agreed to, to do this with, but that wouldn't have made sense. This is what I mean. It's like there's so many different people in like things moving around in this case. They, I feel like it's really easy to, to to lose track of like what the who's what and how, how's who. So 10 years ago, a young man appealed to the public about an extraordinary event he witnessed. A criminal who had been put to death reemerging from his grave in the middle of the night. What was he doing there to begin with anyway? But the public treated his claim as nothing more than an amusing anecdote. That was soon forgotten. Ten years later, the same man steals a waxwork model of the executed criminal, ostensibly to use as a body double for the victim in the case we're discussing here today. Even though the waxwork's build is a poor match for the victim, and his face is obscured by a mask. So the question is, why would the man do such a thing? Which brings us to three days ago, when the birdcage crashed into the crystal tower. If the birdcage had in fact contained not the body of Mr. Asman, but the same waxwork, the coroner from Scotland Yard who investigated Dr. Scythe would have noticed immediately. And yet, she submitted this autopsy report for the victim, which the court has seen earlier. Why? Because the waxwork was that of the professor. Is that what you're saying? Dr. Sai put her name to a document confirming the death of a condemned criminal who was still alive. A criminal whose apparent resurrection was witnessed by Mr. Drebber. But that misconduct was a deadly secret the coroner would do anything to protect. Which is precisely why Mr. Drebber used that particular waxwork as the body double. Ah! Wait. Oh, oh my God. Wow. Oh my God. What the fuck? <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude, this case. So the reason she, oh my God, what the fuck? Okay, that seems like that takes it, that would take, it would take an insane amount of planning because that would mean that they knew for certain that the coroner would be caught Courtney Scythe here, right? So the reason that he used or whoever used, right? The fucking uh, waxwork figure of the professor, they did it. Solely because they knew that if Courtney Scythe came there and investigated it, she would not be able to say anything about it. Because otherwise, it would have led to people potentially discovering this secret that she's been keeping. And that her report was false. So instead, she lied in her, her autopsy report and said that, yeah, the, it did actually happen. This was actually his body. When in fact it wasn't. 
wow, that's an insane reason. Like, holy crap. And that, again, that means someone really knew that this was a lie, right? This is, this, this would have taken a lot of fucking, uh, inside knowledge to glean, to actually be able to, to put this together. So who the fuck would have had all that information? My Lord, this court must summon Dr. Size to the stand. The defense is determined to find out exactly how the coroner and Mr. Trevor are connected. But according to the missive I received this morning through the prosecutor's office, Dr. Scythe is unable to participate in these proceedings. Is that not the case? Oh, boy. She told us so herself, didn't she? Yeah. Lord Van Zeeks won't be summoning me as a witness. Lord Strongheart has forbidden it. Lord Strongheart? The Pandora's box we were warned about is the Professor case. But please don't make the mistake of thinking you'll get any information about it out of me. Oh, God. Something happened on the night of that killer's execution 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Fuck, dude. This, this game is fucking incredible, man. Oh, my God. This game is so good. God damn. So now look at the setup here, right? This is this point right here. This is where Van Zeeks now has a chance to step up. And he's he's absolutely gonna do it, right? This shit ties too closely to himself and to his his brother's death. He is he's got a very vested interest in knowing the truth here. But by doing so, he's absolutely gonna be burning some bridges with Strongheart and his team, who are, you know, by all accounts and purposes, his superiors. So that's like Ooh. Ooh. And surely nobody would want to get to the bottom of that more than Lord Van Zeeks. What you gonna do, Van Zeeks? The prosecution calls for the instructions in that missive to be scrapped. But, but, but Lord Van Zeeks, the missive was issued from Lord Chief Justice's office. Objection. Objection! The assigned prosecutor has the final say on policy in any particular trial. In other words, me. Yes. Let Enoch Drebber and Dr. Scythe both take the stand together. Oh my God, dude. Order, order, order. Yeah, very well. I will uphold your request. Oh, dude, this is gonna... Mm, oh boy. Oh boy. Pandora's box is opening. Bailiff, set up a subpoena with immediate effect. Addressed to Dr. Scythe of the forensic investigation team. The woman is compelled to attend in Her Majesty's orders. All right, then. Enoch Trevor and Dr. Scythe. If they were colluding with one another, this crime could never have been committed. I'm just a stone's throw away. I can feel it. The truth behind all of this is about to come out. It's about to get crazy. Ah, she's up there too. That's a very large stand we have. Thank you for your attendance at such, such short notice, Dr. Scythe. I'm disappointed in you, Lord Van Zeeks. You've completely betrayed the great policy of both Scotland Yard and the prosecutor's office. Betrayal is not in my nature as long as the truth isn't compromised. If it is, if there's even a hint of wrongdoing, then no matter whom it concerns or disgruntles, I will pursue the matter to the bitter end, as would any prosecutor worth his salt. Mr. Drebber, you took the victim's life by means of a machine that you constructed in your workshop. And Dr. Scythe, at the, as the investigating coroner, you were the first on the scene to examine the victim's body. It is the belief of the defense that you collaborated with each other and we're both complicit in this crime. And where's your evidence? At present, we have no definitive evidence, but we do have a very significant clue. What are you talking about? I'm talking, of course, about the waxwork. This model of the killer known as the Professor, who was sentenced to death 10 years ago. You don't need to tell me. I witnessed the man's execution with my own eyes and officially pronounced him dead. That remains to be seen. Is that so? According to the newspaper reports from the time on the night following his execution, the killer came back to life. 
Don't waste my time. And the sole witness to that mysterious event was you, Mr. Drebber, wasn't it? If what you saw in the graveyard that night 10 years ago wasn't some chilling fiction, but reality, it would make you privy to a very great secret of Dr. Size. A secret so profound, it could compel the coroner to agree to collaborate in your evil scheme, in fact. Mr. Drebber, tell the court, tell everyone the truth of what you saw that night in the Loki Cemetery. So he was the student who saw it. You can see the resemblance actually got you with the man in Madame Two Spells. Uh, I mean. Charlie is not going to claim that he really saw what he really saw after all these years. He was a reset student at the University of London, was he? And a bit too clever for his own good, if you ask me. What an interesting twist. When at the time, not one person would take me seriously. Yet now here we are ten years later and suddenly my story matters. And in a court of law too. Very well then, if everyone so wishes. Let's be frank, I'll tell you the truth of what happened that night for what it's worth. Damn, man. Some build-up. So, Mr. Drebber, your testimony, please, about the events of that night, ten years ago. Ten years ago! You will tell the court exactly what you stumble across in Logate Cemetery. Yes, of course. As you wish. <laughs> also, what happened to your arm? <laughs> That's another thing we haven't really got an answer for, either. Like... Why? Why do you have a bionic arm? It means you lost your other arm, right? What happened? In the cemetery ten years earlier. The reason I was in Logate Cemetery at all ten years ago was for a spot of moonlighting, shall we say. Yes, the illustration that newspaper article was based on what I witnessed that night. But thinking back now, I realize that I never actually saw the professor. Soon afterwards, I was visited by a young woman who sculpted a model of me from wax. Then I gave up on my dream of becoming a scientist. And it was all because of that newspaper article. Huh. Wait a minute. You're... You're claiming you didn't actually see the professor now. Of course. You'd have to be a screw loose if you believed a corpse could come back from the dead. But, so you're saying this article is not what the paper is printed on. I think that would describe it perfectly, yes. Ah! The details in the article aren't true. It nullifies your argument for why Mr. Drebber and Dr. Sive have been working together. Yeah, so he's discrediting himself to cripple my argument. Tell me, witness. You claim to have been in the cemetery on some auxiliary business. Can you elaborate? That's right. Grave robbing. To be precise. As you know, Lowgate Cemetery is at the rear of Barclay Prison. So among students at the university, it had a reputation for being haunted by the ghosts of condemned convicts. Grave robbing, you say? Yes, exhuming fresh corpses to sell is reasonably lucrative. Of course, I never laid a finger on any valuables buried with the dead. So you were one of the so-called resurrectionists, a particularly unpleasant scourge on society. Actually, my fellows and I went by another name. The Repurposers. That, that is quite beyond the pale. You would invite divine retribution, sir. Yes, well, I think I suffered retribution enough. The Daily Circus. Eventually unearthed my name and put it in print. It caused me a great many headaches. In the end, I had to leave the university. That was the only paper with the bad grace to identify me unambiguously. I might add. I see. Out of interest, 
who drew the illustration for this article. Ah, yes, that was the reporter who exposed me. He sketched that right in front of me as I described the scene. Oh, there it is. We found it. We found it. We found his motive. Okay. So, okay, that is, that was a sketch. Mr. Odie Asman. He was the reporter who did not actually refrain from using his name. The only one. Everybody else did, w was nice enough to keep him ambiguous. Odie Asman did not. And I'm going to bet, I'm going to bet this is where potentially Odie Asman maybe got like a lot of his starting money or something, right? Before he got into maybe the criminal enterprise, potentially. Because seemingly just as a reporter here, maybe this kickstarted his career. Because this probably ended up selling like hotcakes. And this is what inevitably ended up ruining Drepper's life in a lot of ways. Ooh, there we go. I'm guessing he he probably forgot all about him, right? He probably didn't remember him when he like approached him again about this experiment. Obviously, as time ticked on, I bitterly regretted what I'd done. Claiming to have seen something I never truly saw. Foolish. Very foolish. Mm. Well, counsel for the defense, you may proceed to the cross-examination now. At once, my lord. Okay, let's see if we can dig to the heart of this matter here. So I, I, I do now see it. I see the end game here, for, for at least for this case. Uh, okay, I'm gonna press him here. Just because I feel like this could maybe... He might say something that might make the woman go, well, that's not what happened. Soon afterwards, I was visited by a young woman who sculpted a model of me from wax. Hold it! That young woman being madam to spells, of course. Precisely. I must say I didn't expect to run into her again like this ten years later. As of X, I have explained. I went by the name published in the article and, comme ça, I found the man. Yes, the article in the Daily Circus, I think you said. I was a bar student with barely a penny to my name at the time. And the young lady put five pounds in front of me. So you readily consented to having a waxwork of yourself made and gave permission for it to be put on display. I did. I should sell what little I had to sell, I concluded. Ah, we. Oui. I remember now. I purchased something else from you that day, n'est-ce pas? Did you? I can't say I remember. What was it, madam? His camera. Oh. Oh. Ah. Ah, yes. I made a point of taking it with me whenever I made an excursion into any cemetery. Oh my god, so you're telling- So this is- a, this shit's fucking insane, dude. So yes, the camera here was literally potentially the murder weapon, I guess? Was it not so much that the guy was shot in the back? Did he get, like, bashed in the fucking head by his camera to go- to go back in the ground? Blunt force trauma? Potentially? So that's why there's blood on this camera. It's literally dated back all the way to the 10 years ago. You took a camera with you, sir. To what end? To record the details of the bodies I disinterred. But I had no intention of ever visiting a graveyard again after that night. So... I sold it. Hmm, I see. But I still have it, monsieur. It is part of the special exhibit in my house of horrors. I am very meticulous after about such details. Here's the two spells away. Do you think you should probably clean that shit off before you handed it, handed it to her? It would seem, then, that this is the very camera Mr. Drepper took with him into Logan's Cemetery on the night in question. Yes. Interesting. All right. Uh, actual camera that Mr. Ha Drepper had with him in the cemetery 10 years ago. So, uh, again, my dream of becoming a scientist it was all because of that newspaper article. Anything, uh... I never actually saw the professor at all, though. All right, I'm gonna press him on this now. Thinking back now, I realized I never actually saw the professor at all, though. What are you talking about? I think I explained already. Didn't die. Loki Cemetery is at the rear of Barclay Prison. So it was renowned among us students at the university for being haunted by the ghosts of condemned convicts. 
for some absurd reason, I was scared of the graveyard at night. And as a result, only too willing to believe that nonsense about the dead coming back to life. But you said you actually saw it. I said what I'd seen in my mind's eye. After all, resurrection is impossible, isn't it? You'd have to be unhinged to think otherwise. Unless, of course... You have some evidence that proves I encountered the professor that night. I don't know. Is there any material evidence that could show he really did see the professor? We have anything at all, Mr. Arahoto. I know. I need to present it against that irritatingly backtracking statement of his. The point is, that night was a pivotal moment in my life. Uh, all right, well, I'll keep pressing him then. I, I gave up my dream on becoming a, new, a scientist. It was all because of that newspaper article. This article, you mean? Published in the Daily Circus. Yes, somebody informed the dean that it was my name that appeared in the article. And carelessly let slip that night after night, I was digging up graves. Hardly a mile student, you might say. The university's reputation was execrably defiled, and I was expelled as a result. Mon Dieu, I had no idea. And having been run out of university, you found employment in a somewhat specialist trade. You combined your knowledge of science with knowledge of stage magic to create various experimental machines intended to demonstrate never-before-seen technology. And you use those deceptive machines to trick the government and private investors into giving you money. Professor Albert Hairbrain was just your latest victim, wasn't he? Whatever are you talking about? I have no recollection of doing anything of the sort. Hmm. What's Strapper up to? Why would he suddenly change his stuff? Okay, this is fine. I don't, I don't want to hear this. All right, I don't want any chips. I know what to do. Uh, Illustration News article is based on what I witnessed that night. The strange happening at Logate Cemetery, which you now deny. Not entirely. I ran to fetch the police. At the time, you know, I was shaking like a leaf. But they didn't believe a word of it. In fact, I was very nearly arrested myself. So you went to the papers instead. I started big with the London news, but unsurprisingly, they didn't want to know either. In the end, though, it was reporters from the gossip rags, the gutter press that came to get my story. And it spread like the plague through the capital as gossip-hungry Londoners lapped up the tale. The story was in every single paper at the time, with the exception of some broadsheets. And yet, only two or three of them actually interviewed me personally. Most of the accounts turned out to be very interpretive ghost stories. What about the article in the Daily Circuits? Circus. That particular journalist found me at my dormitory. I don't know how, but he discovered my name. So I recounted to him exactly what had happened that night. And from your description, he drew this illustration. Precisely. That's how I learned that the condemned man was the infamous professor. Because the reporter told me so. I had no idea myself, you see. Newspaper reporters are wont to stoop around in matters that don't concern them. So the scene portrayed in the illustration is accurate, then. Well. Hmm. Oh, okay, I just present the paper here. What? Really? That's it? All I did was present the actual the actual newspaper? I was trying to present the camera, but it wasn't it wasn't counting it. I was like, oh, okay, I guess I just had to glean that information and then I could present the paper. Sorry, Mr. Trevor, but I don't believe that. Don't believe what? Your latest claim. You did see the professor on that night ten years ago. Hmm. Oh dear. We seem to be at odds. But I was there, and you were not. I know what I didn't say. The illustration with this article was drawn based upon what you told the journalist that you witnessed. 
A figure emerging from a tomb, wearing an iron mask. Yes, when the killer was tried ten years ago, it was decided in the closed court's ruling that the man would wear the mask to hide his identity. It wasn't to be removed, even during his execution and subsequent burial. Not even the prison wardens were to see the man's face. But obviously, the provision of this mask was not public knowledge. So, Mr. Drebber, as you've just heard, nah, a lowly student of the University of London certainly wouldn't have known about the condemned man's mask. So unless you'd actually seen the professor that night, it's inconceivable that the artist would have included the mask in that illustration. Huh. <sighs> Order! Order! Well, Mr. Drebber. It's a vile secret, isn't it? If you look closely. And as I've already been at pains to point out, I was utterly petrified. Which is why I had it in my head that I'd seen such a blood curdling sight. But afterwards, I came to my senses and realized that I'd been mistaken. You, you're still saying you didn't see it? If you're stubbornly sticking to that story, witness, then amend your testimony to explain exactly how you think your eyes deceived you. Of course. Of course, only too happy to oblige. I see. I can't believe he's still not going to concede the point. Uh, okay, here we go, here we go. That's the, that's the, that's the thing. I, I could have actually shown that to him earlier, but the thing was, it wasn't, that still isn't going to stop him, right? This is where now he's going to set up what I actually need. The camera for, right? What I in fact witnessed was a fellow grave robber at work. Uh... Hold it! A fellow grave robber? What are you talking about? Well, I wasn't the only one busy in the cemetery that night, you know. Other body snatchers were at work. Of course, when I saw one emerging from the hole he dug, my heart very nearly stopped. So that's the terrifying sight I actually saw, you see. You're claiming it was just another student on equally insalubrious business as yourself. Many of the medical students would wear metal masks to protect them from bacteria during dissections. Clearly, the fellow was using such a mask to protect his anonymity. Wouldn't you say? But there's more to the story, isn't there? The article goes on to say, In the next second, a gunshot rang out suddenly from behind. The bullet pierced the resurrected man's chest, whose breath instilled once more. We might assume that the sexton discovered the miscreants at work, perhaps, and fired upon one of them. The grave digger had shot someone in the cemetery. I think it might have been rather big news, my lord. Oh, yes, well. <laughs> I can only assume it was an embellishment bolted on later by the reporter. Oh, here we go. I had a feeling at some point she was going to say something. <laughs> Strange. Excuse me. Excuse me! Mount your spells. Don't take it out on Mr. Holmes. <laughs> Die! Die! Ow, 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 ow. Oh la la, pardon. I was lost in my thoughts. Would it be fair to say Mr. Drebber's last remark was significant to you in some way? Yeah, because you would have been there, right? I always thought it was a little strange, that is all. How Mr. Drebber could claim this now. If you don't mind me saying, madam. What are you talking about? Well, when I met you ten years ago at your university dormitory, you recounted to me about your adventures in the cemetery, no? Including the gunshot. Stop! Oh! You might want to... Watch your tongue! You know... Objection! Have a care, Drebber. That's no way to speak to a lady. Ah. Uh. Please, ma'am, to spells carry on. Of course. According to what Monsieur Drebber told me at the time, he did hear a gunshot from behind him, and the bullet hit the condemned man. I said nothing of the sort. No, you were very explicit about the details, about the mask that the figure was wearing. 
and the blood that splattered over you when he was shot. Enough! Shut up, woman! You're making all this up! That will do. Ah, uh, here we go. Mr. Trevor. Huh? Yes? You refute the account just given by Madame to Spells. I have no recollection of ever saying those things. Come on, do you really expect us to believe you? Control yourself, counsel. I will not permit baseless accusations in my courtroom. Right. Under the circumstances, I think it's best that you supplement your testimony with a statement to clarify your position on this witness. <laughs> Very well. Here we go. Here we go. Finally, we get to the heart of the matter. There was no gunshot from, from behind me at all, nor any spattering of blood. And lo and behold... Objection! Mr. Drepper, do you remember this camera? But that is the camera from that fateful night. Yes, we borrowed it from the House of Horrors. It's the camera you took with you to the cemetery that night, Mr. Drepper. And... Is that supposed to be significant? This kind of camera is rarely seen in our homeland, so my colleague and I were keen to examine it closely. We noticed that the lens extends forward on the end of the, some bellows. Like this. Hold it! Hold it! Oh my god, I was supposed to ever said that! <laughs> well, I didn't even know I could I didn't even know I could say that. See those new words? That was cool. Anyway, what's that? This just on the bellows. It looks like a dark red stain. Uh, that's right. It's a rather conspicuous mark here on the bellows, in fact. Good lord, are you suggesting? Yes, my lord. It would appear to be a spatter of blood. Something that could be confirmed with a simple chemical test. Isn't that right, Dr. Scythe? It would be difficult to determine if it was human blood and not the blood of some animal. But yes, to test whether or not it's blood at all is simple enough. I propose that Madame Tuspell's testimony was correct, and that on the night in question ten years ago, you were spattered with blood from the gunshot wound. Well, I... And that furthermore, you really did witness the condemned professor emerging from his tomb! Gah! Gah! There's simply no way you could have forgotten such a traumatic experience. In other words, the only explanation is that you're trying to hide the fact that you saw the professor that night. Objection! Objection! But why? Why would he want to do that? Well, not for his own gain, it would seem. But who's then? Who could benefit? Mr. Trevor's obviously lying in order to protect somebody. My goodness, he's shielding someone. Yes, my lord. And clearly, it's someone who doesn't want the truth about the professor's coming back to life to be exposed. Well, counsel, who is it then? Who is this witness trying to protect by lying about what he saw that night? That would be, uh, you, madam. The obvious answer is Dr. Scythe. Scythe? Wh whatever do you mean? Imagine if the convict who had been sentenced to death was not, in fact, killed. Imagine if that was to come to light. What are you insinuating? And imagine if the convict in question was the country's most hated mass murderer. If it was the professor. That, that would be an unprecedented scandal. Objection! This is beyond a joke. Need I point out that the dead cannot come back to life? What you're suggesting would mean that the execution never actually happened. Yes, that's exactly what it would mean. Objection! Once a man is sent to the gallows, he hangs. No one could escape, not in Great Britain. Objection. But the fact is, there was a witness to the fact that the man did escape his hanging. If that were tr really true, counsel, the implications of this misconduct would not stop at the supervising coroner. It would take the honor of the entire judiciary from the ground up. 
And it's exactly because of those monumental repercussions that Dr. Scythe would consent to any demand made of her by someone who threatened to expose the secret, even if that meant being complicit in a crime. So what the fuck was her motive? <laughs> why? Huh? Like, why did this happen? You, you mean? I mean that Dr. Scythe wasn't collaborating in Mr. Drebber's wicked scheme. She was coerced into collaborating in order to protect her decade-old secret. She switched the dead body of Mr. Asman with the waxwork model and fabricated the autopsy report. Ah! Oh, yeah! Oh! oh, my God. Lore Fan 6. Oh, my God. I waited so demon long. What are we here? We're like 21 episodes into this horse shit. And fucking finally. Oh! Sorry, sorry, that was a very, I, he's teased us for so long. That was the biggest nut I just let out. I, I literally based my entire Let's Play previously on, on it based on that leg and it hasn't shown up till just now. Oh, I teased us for so long, but oh my God. Oh, oh God, I need to hydrate after that nut. Oh, look at that beautiful fucking thing. Pray forgive my freshly filled hallowed chalice and my sexy thigh and a whole raft of other discourtesies now. Goodness me. Oh. <laughs> God damn, dude. I love that thing so much. I want to I see him literally karate fucking chop this damn desk in half with his leg. It's just the sort of tall tale Londoners would enjoy, I grant you. An executed killer rising from the dead, a Scotland Yard cover-up, conspiracy at the highest levels. So let me ask you one thing. What's that? If the condemned man really did emerge from his tomb that night, only to be shot in the chest, who pulled the trigger and disposed of him forever? Uh, well, I have no idea at the moment. We have too little information to work that out at present, I think. I I couldn't agree more. Oh, pour me myself, myself another glass. I'm parched as well. The old Bailey is no place for wild fantasies. Uh, and have you considered this, my learned Nipponese friend? Considered what? Do you realize just what a dangerous endeavor it would be to coerce this woman into such criminal activity? It's tantamount to declaring war on the entire British police force and judiciary. Quite hard to imagine any sum of money being offered for research could warrant it. To rely on some to stage deception with so much as at stake would be madness. Well, well, I suppose. And this was no petty crime either. The victim was murdered. A man who'd already invested money in the venture and would be instrumental in future profits too. Yes, I had no reason to kill Mr. Asman at all. Or are you forgetting that his death results in me receiving not a single penny? The court is already aware of the contract between myself and the victim. No. I think that no, no. The the contract was literally made for this exact reason. This is his, this is his alibi. This is like, oh, well, there you go. Clearly, I'm only in it for the money. That's the only thing I give a shit about. But this is it. This is the point. Once we point out Odie Asman was the one that fucked him over, it's all over. Mm, there is the contract. That's very true. The motive for this case runs deep, though. I can feel it. Using threats to force the head of the forensic investigation team to go co cooperate is extreme. Especially for a government grant he had no guarantee of receiving in the first place. If the research grant was the aim, taking Mr. Asma's life would have made no sense anyway. Which means Mr. Drebber's motive wasn't money at all. He was just trying to kill Mr. Asman. But why? What was his motive then? Your time is up, my learned friend. I say you have one last chance before the jury lose their patience with this charade. Let's see if you can back up your heady proposal, shall we? <laughs> he does, he dodges out of the way. How do you explain why this engineer would throw all caution to the wind and threaten his own country? At this point, I'm not prepared to listen to more of this outlandish conjecture without proof. So, counsel, present your evidence. 
All right. Who exactly was Mr. Asmund to Mr. To Drebber? There's connection there that no one's seen yet. And I'm going to have to present two pieces of evidence to show what it is. Yeah, here we go. Okay, I know exactly what to do. Yes, my lord. The evidence that establishes a motive and explains why the witness wanted the victim dead is right here. So, first you. Take that! It's this newspaper article, my lord. That was written 10 years ago. And every detail has been examined already. What could it possibly tell us? That drivel should never have been written. It's typical gutter press nonsense that means nothing. Yes, on its own, it isn't particularly significant. However, when considered alongside another piece of evidence, it will completely explain your motive for wanting Mr. Asmund dead. What other evidence? Counsel, you will present your supplementary evidence without delay. The evidence, which when cross-referenced with the newspaper article, stops the motive for the, de the deed. Behold. It's this contract, my lord. Mr. Drebber, this is the contract you signed with Mr. Asman. Yes, that's right. The very document, in fact. That proves I had no reason to kill the man. No, I'm afraid not. What? There's something very significant that this newspaper article and the contract have in common. Really? And it's that common link that shows very clearly why you were determined to kill Mr. Odie Asman. It seems the defense has uncovered something the rest of us have missed. So, my learned friend, point out what these two pieces of evidence have in common. Where exactly is the link between this newspaper article and the contract? Behold. Take that! What these two pieces of evidence have in common is a signature. A signature? The signature on the illustration that accompanies the 10-year-old article and the signature on the contract belong to the same person! What? Ah! I like how he, he, you notice he keeps looking over to Dr. Dr. Scythe, right? He's like, oh fuck, oh fuck. As the court has heard, this illustration was drawn 10 years ago by the newspaper reporter who found Mr. Drebber and interviewed him about his ordeal. If you look closely, the reporter's signature can be seen in the bottom right corner of the drawing. And if you look at the contract here, which was signed between the witness and the victim last year, you can clearly see Mr. Asmund's signature at the bottom. Let me see now. Good Lord, yes, they're identical. In short, the journalist who drew the illustration and wrote the article published about Mr. Drebber 10 years ago was the victim of this case, Mr. Odie Asman. Oh. Ah! Objection. Objection! But explain to the court why! Why would that constitute a motive for the witness to murder Asman? Well, if you think back, you'll remember that Mr. Drebber talked about that article in his testimony. G grave robbing, you say? Yes, exhuming fresh corpses to sell is reasonably lucrative. It is quite beyond the pale. You would invite divine retribution, sir. Yes, well, I think I suffered retribution enough. The Daily Circus. Eventually on Earth, my name, and put it in print. It caused me a great many headaches. In the end, I had to leave the university. That was the only paper with the bad grace to identify me unambiguously, I might add. Then I gave up on my dream of becoming a scientist. And it was all because of that newspaper article. At the time, you were a student of the University of London who dreamt of becoming a scientist. However, this single newspaper article changed your entire life. So, Mr. Asman used to be a newspaper journalist, did he? He did, my lord. In fact, it's a widely held belief that Asman managed to position himself at the heart of his criminal act network thanks to the many dubious connections he made during his time as, re as reporter. Hey, gotcha. I was right about that. 
I was kind of thinking, well, I was also kind of thinking that mainly this article probably made him a lot of money. So you had to give up on your dream and leave university. You lost everything. Eventually you found yourself working in the field of science, but only in the shadows. And all because of that article written by Mr. Asman. Hit off! Stop this endless drivel about my life! What? Explain yourself, Mr. Trevor! Yes, it's true. I had to leave the university as a result of that article. But it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. What do you mean? Almost every student of science in the faculty was too poor to actually conduct any research. But they struggled on with their hypotheses anyway. We all did only to have them taken by vultures. Sooner or later, you knew your ideas would be stolen and patented in by some wretch or other after all. Good gracious. Making a name for yourself as a scientist in a climate like that was a miracle only a select few geniuses could ever hope to achieve. Personally, I wasn't one of those geniuses, so it was hardly a wrench. Being forced out of the university because of Logate was the best thing that could have happened to me. Mr. Drebber, do you genuinely believe that? Of course I do! Who's better placed to know whether or not I possess a talent for science than me? I'm sorry to say that your words don't ring true at all. How dare you! And I have evidence to prove it. How are you in a position to say anything about me? I don't know you from Adam! Fine. If you think you have evidence, go ahead. Show it! What could you possibly have to disprove the idea that I was having to leave the university because I lack talent? Take that. This stat- this- this trophy. Do you remember this, Mr. Drubber? We found it at your workshop. I is that- a Royal Society Trophy for Excellence in Science. What exactly is this trophy, Council? It's the greatest honor that can be bestowed upon a young scientist, my lord. There is no higher accolade. It recognizes emerging talent and promises a bright future. Good gracious. Your prospects for the future were excellent, weren't they, Mr. Drebber? Because even then, you were a genius in your field. But you lost everything. You had no more future. Your talents would go to waste. All as a result of this one newspaper article. I don't know when you realized who Mr. Asman was, and when it dawned on you that he was the same journalist who 10 years ago ruined your life. It's abundantly clear that you had no intention of forgiving the man. The truth is... Finally, he's going to fold. Uh-oh. Uh Scythe? <sighs> Fine. Clearly this has run its course now. What? I admit it. All of it. What? What are you doing? It's exactly as the Japanese man said. I was coerced into going along with this man's plot to murder the victim. On the condition that he kept my dirty secret from ten years ago. I... No. Good lord! 